So I'm going to just jump into what I felt the Lord asked me to title it today, which was that we have to resist the reversion to perversion of truth. And just to remind people, because truth is, is being challenged today, more than it ever has been in my lifetime. I'm getting up there, but I like what Mario Marillo says. I was born in the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> And then he says, how many other people in the house were born in the year 19, none of your business? Anybody else? It's amazing how many people were born in that year, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, when I was growing up, my father was a veteran of the Army. I mean, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, being patriotic was an amazing thing. And, and we, you know, they gave their lives. They knew people who died. And something flipped, and all of a sudden it became politically incorrect to be patriotic about America. But nobody wants to leave. <laughs> they hate the country, but they don't want to leave. And I'm not saying they should leave, but maybe, maybe it's easier to destroy things than it is to build things. <laughs> not maybe. It definitely is. So the reversion to perversion, I don't mean just in a sexual way, perversion. That's what most of us would think about. But, but perverse just means something that's out of order. That's not meeting the mark, right? You know the word sin is, is an archery term, which implies that you're missing the mark. Anybody else ever heard that before? Right? So if you're missing the mark, that means there's a bullseye, but with our behavior, it's, it's perverted, and it doesn't hit the mark because we didn't follow that straight path that he gave us. And if we're honest, you know some of these verses that a lot of us hear when we first get saved is that all have sinned, Right? So this is tying in for me, at least. I just wanted to remind you that three weeks ago, June 26th, it was my father, my truth compass, right? Truth is right in the title. We're, we're thinking about truth and not perverting truth. And the next week it was, all truth is inconvenient to somebody, right? So there was a movie out called Inconvenient Truth. Well, guess what? If you want to do what you want to do and the Word of God says you can't, that's inconvenient, isn't it? But which is the better option? Do it God's way, right? There's a reason. And that's why it talks about suffering. You wouldn't think that Jesus would have suffered. But he did. He suffered because he was tempted just like we were. And he fought off the temptation. And we need strength. Would you agree? We need strength. We need an immune system. We act together like an immune system with each other as we live life together. And you're confused about something. You can't stand up in the middle of a church service and say, I have a question. I guess you could, but the usher might escort you out. But in a Bible study, you can. On a Zoom call, you can. And, and we just get to answer some of these difficult questions that we... We know the Bible was written a long time ago, and there might not be the specific thing we're dealing with in there, but the principles are in there. Because you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's amazing. And then last week we talked about how that inconvenient truth can often lead to a dangerous yes. <laughs> and God is asking, who will I send? And Isaiah is like, here I am. Send me. I'll go. Jesus said, I'll go. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So I don't know, thinking that Christianity and convenience kind of go hand in hand, there's, there's cost to pay. There's a price to pay when you're serving the Lord. But if you think that's bad, try serving the devil. Way worse. <laughs> there's a cost to commitment to Christ, but there's a bigger cost to commitment to Satan. And there's only two options on the menu. Right? So you're saved now and you're following him, but we can revert back to perversion. Do you agree? Say yes. The service will go faster. <laughs> so I, I heard a man, I love this analogy. He said, he's been in so many different places preaching. He said, I can tell when a church has a bunch of intercessors in there because when I get up to preach, the atmosphere is ripe. And I also have been in places where they didn't pray and there was no atmosphere. And he said it was like trying to drive a nail into a wall with a bare hand. Oh, man, not here. I'm telling you, not here. You guys are ripe for this thing, right? But we're not just here to hear it. We're here to integrate it and to do the truth. And if there's anything, you could write on me in your notes, like anything the Lord prompts you as we're talking through these different verses, what might be a little borderline, 
right? What might not be exactly true. Well, that's an extremist view. I can do this. Okay, well, let's just try to live life together and say, yes, you can. It's a free country, but should you? That could be legalistic. I get it. But once you have conviction that something is wrong, and, you know, the Bible is real clear about this, that the people in the world, the devil has blinded their eyes to the truth of the word, and that we live in a spiritual dimension. So you could think, you know, as I said, perversion applies to sexual behavior, of course, not just that. But people in the world don't understand the spiritual aspect of sexual union. And Paul made it really clear, this isn't just a physical thing. You become one with the person that you're having sex with. And when that breaks off, part of you goes with them. You're fragmented now. And the devil loves fragments. He loves empty spaces to come into. So they don't know that. So they're just about their business doing what the world says. And we have a better way. Is it easy? You think being a Navy SEAL is easy? Aren't you glad we have Navy SEALs? Yeah, and you know, when you see the police officer out there, could you just go bless him? Could you thank him? We support the police. Whoever thought you had to say that? We're really glad they're here. Hope you are too. And Paul is just blunt, right? And, you know, he just gets right to the point. He's not worried about hurting too many people's feelings. He speaks the truth in love. But he speaks the truth. And we're supposed to do the same thing. And he starts chapter 3 of Galatians. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you? And that's pretty strong language, isn't it? Because this is a Christian church he's talking to. And it's really very, uh, an awakening kind of word of casting a spell that there's something really wrong going on here. You've been duped. You're not looking and listening to the truth. And he, oops, he goes on to say, the only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the spirit of God by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? And this is a common thread throughout the New Testament is that the new believers kept trying to shift back to what they were used to. We would call that today muscle memory. Right? You know that one? You know how you can get into habits and you start going to the same way to work every day? And even when there's construction going on, you forgot on your way? You're like, dang, I did this yesterday. How come I didn't remember? Because we check out sometimes. And we have muscle memory, and that's what happens. And he's saying, you know you didn't come into this realization by following the law, but you have to break that muscle memory and think it's going to be by your works that you have to earn favor with God. He said all that in those little two verses there. <laughs> he says, are you so foolish? Although you began with the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by human effort? Can't work. The just shall live by faith. Faith without works is dead. So not, he's not, you know, James said that. It's not that you don't do works, but it's your motivation for why. You're not trying to earn. God doesn't mind effort, but he is not going to work for earning. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. He already loves you more than you even realize. So just get to know the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. You get to know the Son. You see the image of God made flesh. The invisible God visible in Christ. What a gift. Thank you, Lord. So here's what the dictionary says about perverse. Okay, again, not just sexual. Willfully determined or disposed to go counter to what is expected or desired. Turned away from or rejecting what is right, good or proper, wicked or corrupt. All right, so this is pretty pertinent today. We, we should be careful that we don't go to extremes on how we interpret what, the, what Scripture says is because I like to say you hold on loosely to, to life. Because as soon as you get too rigid and you start making too many rules, that becomes legalism. But if you're too lenient and, and anything goes, that's not good either. So we read the word through the lens of Holy Spirit, and he shows us how to apply it in every situation. So Jesus meets that woman who's caught in adultery. They throw him down, her down at his feet, and, and they think they have him dead to rights. He gets down and starts saying, okay, Lord, how should I explain this to them? Let's see if I do this here. Like, he's getting a download right in the moment. He didn't have to come up with some religious answer. He trusted the Father to speak to him right in that moment. He said, you know what? Why don't you who is without the first stone, you, you cast, without sin, cast the first stone. Drop, drop, drop. A lot of stones falling down. And then he says, where are your accusers? 
And she says, I don't know, but I'm sure glad you're here. I would have been in big trouble if I didn't fall down at your feet. And he said, that's right. Go and sin no more. <laughs> Change what you're aiming at because you're aiming too low. You got to aim high. You'll still fall short a little bit, but at least you're aiming high. And there's no holy grail. There's nothing you have to hold on to. No idols from the past if they're contrary to what the word says. So, look, there's times when you do have to protest. Martin Luther King said, I do want to follow the law, but an unjust law is no law at all about segregation in the South, right? So it's not that you never disagree about something, but you have to know the truth. And the elders would sit at the gates in Jerusalem when people had a difficult decision to make. They went because they trusted those people because they knew the word. And their advice was wise advice. Wisdom is not knowledge, right? Wisdom is knowing all the facts, but then knowing how to apply it. And nobody here doesn't need somebody else here. We all need each other. There's no expert guy or gal that knows everything. Everybody can learn and get closer to being more like Jesus. I see a lot of head shaking. That's good. You're all kind of quiet. <laughs> Jesus said, these words I speak to you. Now, important context is it's the end of, of Matthew chapter 7, and Matthew 5, verse 1, is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So you go all the way through 5, all the way through 6, all the way to the end of 7. That's one sermon. And when he says, these words I speak to you, he's talking about the last three chapters. That's a long sermon. They're foundational words for you to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, see, that's so different than just taking notes in a notebook. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. So church is important because we get to meet other people that are trying to be sold out for God. And none of us gets it perfectly right, but we talk to each other and we work through it together. And we do Bible studies together and we pray together. And you find somebody that you connect with that can grow together with you. And it's like going to the gym. You know how it is when somebody's there to meet you, you get out of bed even when you don't feel like it. And there's those times that you're pushing that bench press and, and the other person just needs two fingers and you lift that big bar up. Man, wow, we need each other. And don't judge, just help each other. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on a solid rock. We sang it today. Christ is my firm foundation. Resist the reversion to perversion of truth. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Anybody ever read this verse before? That's one of the ones you hear when you first get saved. It's like, look, it's not a fair game. We were born into sin. And you might think that's normal if you haven't accepted the Lord yet, but there's a better way. You don't need to live under that diagnosis of sin forever. You can be saved from that sinful nature. Doesn't mean you'll never sin again, but it won't be intentional. Hopefully. <laughs> I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to every man according to his ways. <laughs> I try the reins. It's like he's on the saddle and he's trying the reins. Which way do you want to go? And I give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So, again, is this works mentality or dying on the cross and letting him resurrect the new person? <laughs> and that's what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. His faithfulness comes into me because I have his spirit. And we're not trying to outperform each other, but we are trying to die faster. <laughs> because if we could die to that old nature and that allow his resurrection power, we have to do a lot less because it's more pure Jesus in us. You with me? I'm glad somebody said amen to that. Romans 3.23, I quoted it already. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his works? What does it say? Every day you can fall on your knees and say, thank you, Lord, for another day I'm alive. If I didn't meet you, I wouldn't be alive. I know that for a fact. Peter Roselli could say that. Whether you could say that or not doesn't matter. I'm alive to you today. Because you live, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Timothy was written, uh, Paul was writing letters to his spiritual son, Timothy. And again, it's firm language. You ever hear somebody say, well, you might not want to watch that. It contains adult language. 
What does that mean? Curses. That's what the world says. Adult language is accountability, responsibility, virtue, being fidelity, being faithful to your spouse. Like the world doesn't want that. They don't want any rules. That's why they don't like the idea of truth. Because if you could just scramble people that there really is no such thing as truth, then anything goes. Well, if you could read this book and think that anything goes, you got the wrong interpretation. No way. And this is how Paul worded it, at least in the message. It says, there are some, some you know who by relaxing their grip and thinking anything goes have made a thorough mess of their life. Anybody remember the King James word that's used there? Shipwreck. Shipwreck their life. Oh, I could relate, but it's never too late. You come out, you get pulled out of that mess. Second Timothy, that was first Timothy. Two says, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Be with people who are filled with the Spirit of God and with the Word of God. I mean, if you're witnessing to somebody and you're there, like we just prayed for Boris, he knows that man doesn't know the Lord, and he's going to go in with a tender heart, and he's going to ask the Lord as I'm talking to this man. I love him. He's my friend, but he's lost. What words can I give him that will bring the life of God? Should really bring you, Linda. You'll get that guy saved in a minute. <laughs> Shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Their message will spread like cancer. <laughs> cancel culture, cancer. <laughs> you see, Man, cancel culture, wow, they don't want to know about the truth. Your language is violence against me, so if I disagree with you, I can use violence to stop you because I disagree with you. No, that's not what the Constitution says. We're entitled to free speech here. Their message will spread like cancer. And he says, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. Another way of saying sin. Right? Now, we're not holding anybody guilty in court if you if you sinned about something there's forgiveness available but you have to know that it's a lie and the only way you know how to separate the truth from the lie is to know this book right read it absorb it talk to other people teach it when you get a chance to tell other people about it and then it becomes ingrained and in you you metabolize it into your system and now you get that discernment increasing in your life and you know the difference between good and evil almost done with 2 Timothy here. Now, Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, right? The same way they resisted Moses, so do these who also resist the truth. Anybody here guilty of resisting the truth? <laughs> yeah, you guys know what I'm, where I'm going, right? Like, maybe less than you used to. And certainly less than before you were saved because you didn't know what was true. Well, where I was growing up here in New Jersey, close to New York City, it was like, do unto others before they do it unto you, right? That was our golden rule. You get them before they get you, because they're all out to get you. Like, what are you, you you're going to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? You know somebody who's going to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge? Like, that was, everything was a game. It started out as a scam, and you have to prove you're not a scam. Wow, that, like, you need discernment to live around here. <laughs> I'm appointed a preacher. Oh, man, I love the way Paul, he had such a shift. He, he went from murdering the Christians to writing a huge chunk of the New Testament. Isn't that amazing how God could take what the devil meant for evil and turn it around for good? And that same person that was killing Christians is now ready to die on behalf of Christ. We don't have to face being killed for our faith, but, but there are certainly costs involved with serving the Lord. We've got to be willing to pay the price. If you want to watch a real good short video, yesterday we posted one by a guy named Tommy Ara, Arayami. I believe that's how you say it. I might be mispronouncing it. It's only six minutes long. Watch it because he does a great explanation of the cost of serving God, but also the cost of serving the devil. <laughs> there's only two choices, okay? Yes, there's a cost of serving God. Wow, is it way better than the other lifestyle? He says, I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. He was in jail. And look what he says. I'm not ashamed. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I know I chose the right team. And I don't care if they put me in jail. I'm going to win the guards in the prison. I'm going to speak to everybody I know about this. For I know whom I have believed. Anybody remember the song that we used to sing? 
I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Yeah, you got, we got some old schoolers here. Yeah, all right, sorry, Anna Bellotta. She's a young schooler. They were singing that song. <laughs> for which cause I also suffer these things. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And he, I am persuaded that he is able. That's the rest of it, right? And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day that I'm going to meet him face to face. I know who I have believed. Paul said the same thing. Uh, an angel appeared to me last night. Remember this in the book of Acts when he was on the ship? And he said, of the God of whose I am and who I serve. <laughs> Man, that's knowing your identity in Christ. Hmm. Thank you, Easter. I'm getting some energy from the front row over here. So, look, here's another one of those variable words. You know, what the culture would try to say now, what is obscenity, okay? Well, you know, you think this because you have that repressive Christian thing going on, but people should be allowed to do whatever they want. Well, listen, you are allowed to do whatever you want, but there's consequences to your decisions. And in this sexual world piece of obscenity, it's like, where do you draw the line? Well, people that want to be freeloaders, well, I don't say freeloaders, that's the wrong implication, but free to do whatever I want whenever I want, then no law is a good law. Because they want to just live with an infinite amount of pleasure and not recognize the penalty of that pleasure, right? This is kind of common sense, isn't it? I'm trying to rip anybody here? We want... It said, I quoted it earlier, the Lord doesn't wish one person to perish. He loves them all, but there's consequences to sin. So this was the way the language uh, in this, uh, this was a Ph.D. thesis somebody was writing. And they said, obscenity began to emerge as an important issue in Great Britain in 1857 when this Obscene Publications Act was passed. The measure was intended to apply exclusively to works written for the single purpose of corrupting morals of youth. They recognized that children have to be protected as, as innocent until they're old enough to make their own decisions. We don't recognize that today. We're passing laws that say we can teach them about homosexuality in kindergarten. My tax dollars are being used for that. Let me say, the answer isn't move to North Carolina. <laughs> okay? Don't be jumping ship on us. We need you here. The answer is run for the school board. <laughs> Get some common sense and godly sense on that. Like, wait a minute. It used to be illegal when Peter Roselli was a young kid in 19 none of your business. They used to hide all the pornography behind a counter with brown wrappers around it. Now you want to bring it into school. No, what changed? The truth didn't change. It's this confusion that you're all in that it doesn't matter. Well, it matters. In 1857, that was 165 years ago, they had enough common sense to know that. Corrupting morals of youth and of a nature calculated to shock the common feelings of decency in any well-regulated mind. <laughs> Some good wording, right? What's a well-regulated mind? Think on these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is good, whatever is holy, think on these things. Sure, there's a whole menu of other stuff. Never been a bigger menu of other stuff. That makes the truth look even better. It's insane what people are willing to accept right now in the name of not wanting to hurt other people's feelings. So I try to keep it a little light. It's really not funny, but I'm going to try to keep it light. This is really an, an amazing picture right here. It's a warrior woman. It says, family, steal our inheritance, not on my watch. You're not stealing my inheritance. This is our watch. We're here now. So if we have our head in the sand, that's not very discerning. Well, I shouldn't say anything. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Like, no, they're, you got to speak the truth. Do it in love, but speak the truth. So this was a recent question that was asked to somebody who was being nominated to be a Supreme Court justice. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? She's a woman. 
She has three daughters. No, I can't. I'm not a biologist. If my father heard that story, he would think he woke up in the Twilight Zone. She got nominated with that answer. And I know, I'm not meaning to be critical of her. She's reading her script. She's being fed a script. And that's the only way she can pass the test. But look at what happens to your soul. The only thing wrong, the only thing needed for evil to prevail is for good men and women to do nothing. i got to read my script because I'll get canceled. Paul didn't care about getting canceled. All right, now, obviously, Jesus didn't care about getting canceled. But here's Paul, who is murdering the Christians, is now willing to die. And when other people saw that he was willing to die, they started crying. They said, what are you doing? Don't you realize we got a better inheritance coming? Nothing this world can offer comes close to what we're going to have on the other side, but what we can have here on this side. Because it's way better to be faithful to your spouse than to be cheated. Do you think anybody here that has a daughter wants her to marry somebody with an open marriage when it comes to sex? Like, what? That would go against your nature as a mom. You want to protect your child. She'll be a, a strip dancer at 11 years old? That's not on the list. No, you want her to find somebody who's going to love her and protect her. Man, like this, where did this go? How come we can't even recognize how important all these things are? Is because you're like the frog in the kettle. Just turn up the heat a little bit at a time. But yeah, this is kind of nice. I need some soap in here. And before you know it, you're being eaten. Isn't this a great face? I love this kid. I don't know who he is, but I love that face. This lady's going to be on the Supreme Court, and she can't define a woman. Huh? Mom, I think we're in trouble. What kind of country did you bring me into here? And look, you know, there's real practical ways that we can think about this. One of them is bathrooms. My dad, again, I'll just say, my dad was born in 1921. Okay, dad, look, there, there's no more girls' room and boys' room anymore. Everybody could just go into one bathroom. What? What are you smoking? My daughter's not going in a bathroom with, with boys. No way. This is, a kid would know this. Curriculum in school, I already touched on that, but I object to my tax dollars being used to something I am vehemently opposed to. And look, here's another thing that happens. They shoot for the kindergarten. You used to have to be 18 years old before you could buy that Playboy in the, in the convenience store. It was illegal to do it younger than that. And you have to show proof of your identity, right? So this was a real deal. Pornography was a real deal. Now they want to bring it into kindergarten. Like, how far have we fallen? But then in Florida, they said, well, we can't start till third grade. Third grade is too, too young, but they think they won because it's not kindergarten. And in one way, they did. It's better than nothing, but really, like, we're not saddling for third grade. They're too young. That's not what they should be, be taught, but we live in a democracy where we all have to vote. So if you don't want to vote because you don't think Christians should be involved, you're not reading your Bible. The whole point of the New Testament is there's a new king. His name is Jesus. We're not here to violently oppose. We're here to talk truth and live as close as we can to the truth. And, and what they're trying to tear down took hundreds and hundreds of years to accumulate. There's no perfect solutions, only trade-offs, okay? That's a very wise economist said that. Everybody wants the perfect solution. There's no perfect solution. There's only trade-offs. You build a system with as much checks and balances as you can, but you'll always find something wrong. Find a better system out there and move there. No problem. Anybody here want to start a fund to buy the plane ticket to let those folks go? <laughs> you sure? Uh, I'll try to calm down a little. Your daughter's a swimmer. She wants to go to college. 
she's so good that she got a scholarship. She gets a scholarship to go to college. Uh-oh. Hey, Dad, there's a guy on the team who says he's a girl, but he's a biological man, and he's way bigger than everybody else. My father would say, what are you, stupid? <laughs> he used to like to say that. <laughs> you can't really answer that question, by the way. You can't say yes. If you say no, bam, here it comes, right? <laughs> so we want to protect women's rights unless it's a male swimmer on the, on the team, and then we don't care about the women's rights. What? And then here's another one. <laughs> Prisons. There's women being raped by biological men who said that they identify as a woman. I was born at night, but not last night. Okay? This guy is in prison for raping people, and now all he has to do is say, I'm a woman. And he gets in a women's prison. What happened to us? We strayed from the truth. You become dull of hearing, it says in Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk not solid food. Well, yeah, third grade ain't good enough. All right, if you think that's a good answer, uh, we could do better than that. For everyone lives on milk is unskilled and the word of righteousness since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained. Anybody here want your powers of discernment trained? Every hand should be going up right now. It's getting hard to know how to navigate through all this stuff. In the world, anybody here work a job outside the home? This is in all the corporations now. What you're needing to sign and what you're agreeing to, to get certain kinds of training. Like, wait a minute, we're here to make a product, not to make a political statement. Our powers of discernment are trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Part of the constant practice could be come out on Wednesday night, come out on Sunday morning, offer to help when you can, be a volunteer, and emerge yourself in a culture where everybody is at least trying to aim high. We ain't, nobody's perfect. We're not going to hit it all the time. But if we're with each other, that's that immune system. Right? You ever hear this phrase, anti-fragile? Okay? Some things are fragile. Some things are resilient. Right? So if it's fragile, it would break. If it's resilient, it wouldn't break. But some things get stronger when they're tested, when they're pushed. So the opposite would be participation trophy. Everybody on the team gets a trophy because you tried. Well, that's not a trophy. A trophy is the one who runs the race and wins. And Paul said, if you're going to run the race, run it to win. Let's cast aside Hebrews Let's cast aside every weight that's holding us back so we can run faster. The besetting sins that hold us back. That's the whole life, the whole life we're here. There's another layer that we can look at and say, what's the next thing that's got to go? And there's nothing bad about that. It's great to feel like you're getting more like Jesus every day. I think I made the point. I'll go quickly. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and yet have found them liars. And you have persecuted and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And you know when the next word is but, <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've lost your first love. Another... Uh, video that we posted last week with Jane Hammond speaking about the spirit of Belial. Anybody see it? It's really good. You should check it out. And she talks about how the enemy's assignment with Belial is to wear us down so we can't serve the Lord, to rob us of our strength to want to serve him. It's a spiritual warfare. You left your first love. All these great things that they were doing, but he still has this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. That's a challenge. You're going to get stronger through the testing. That's the way this works. Run the race to win. Press towards the mark for the prize. Will you fall short sometimes? Yes. 
But listen, if you're having somebody operate on your father's heart and you love your father, do you want the top of the class doctor or the one who just made it in on, by the skin of his teeth? Like there's, this is common sense. It's not equal outcomes. It's the people who are the most qualified to do the job get to do it. And even the best of the best don't get it right every time. So look, you know, I don't want to hurt people's feelings, but I have to live by a truth compass. And nobody said that Paul was worried about hurting anybody's feelings. We should speak the truth in love. I know I've repeated myself several times on that. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, whew, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Do you have like three more minutes left? Anybody raise your hand? Three, six, nine, twelve. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> this is Paul talking in the Message Bible. When Peter came to Antioch, I had a face-to-face -face confrontation with him. I was really worried about hurting his feelings, but I had to do it. Because huh? he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain people came from James, Peter was regularly eating with the non-Jews. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and his non-Jewish friends. That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique pushing the system of circumcision. <laughs> The rest of the Drew, Jews in Antioch joined the hypocrisy, and even Barnabas, who was one of Paul's mentors, was swept along in the what? In the charade. Do we have to tell the young people what a charade is? Like, maybe they never played that game, charades. It's, it's play acting. It's people wearing masks. This is a charade. No, this isn't it. Does it tickle the ears? Sure does. But is it the truth? No, you don't want any adulterated truth. So I just said, warning, don't let the fear of man scare you into reverting to a perversion, perverse, compromised view of your faith. Take your stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This is how Paul says it in the message. I'm just going to finish in Romans 7 and 8, and we're done. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> People think I pay him to do that. <laughs> I'm full of myself. Come on, Nate. Help me out here. <laughs> this is how it says it, right? Like anybody can relate to being full of yourself? Yeah. A few honest people in the house. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. <laughs> what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way and then I act another way. Doing the things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it's obvious that God's command is necessary. This is God's command. Everybody know that, right? The B-I-B-L-E. But I need something even more than the B-I-B-L-E. Right? Because if you don't apply it, just knowing the word isn't enough. It's the truth that you know that will set you free. Knowing in the way a husband and wife know each other. I need something more, for if I already know the law, but I can't keep it, and the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need more help. I realize I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My quote-unquote decisions don't result in actions. Something's gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. I truly delight can relate to this, right? I truly delight in God's command, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me is joining in that delight. Parts of me covertly revel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Say yes. <laughs> The answer, thank God, is Jesus Christ can do something and does do something about it. The only one, the perfect sacrifice. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, the fateful dilemma is resolved. We shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. 
God who would not even spare his own son, how much more would he not freely give you all things that you need? With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's life no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying, black cloud. Man, do you think this is current for 2022? How many people do you meet that are living in this low-lying, black cloud of depression? Suicide is up. What? What's going on? We got good news. I love this. There's a new power in operation. It's this word mixed with the power of the Spirit and a humble heart that's willing to let him mold us into that vessel of honor. The Spirit of Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a lifetime fate of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Let's stand. This isn't just words, folks. Anybody here been delivered from a lifetime of brutal tyranny under the, under the leadership of the devil? Can you make some noise and say, I'm free. I'm free. When I said yes to Jesus, that stuff left. The brutal tyranny of the devil's operation over my life was canceled because I got into the truth of the word. Am I perfect at it? No. Is he perfect at it? Yes. So if I just keep looking in the mirror, am I more like Jesus today than yesterday? If the answer is yes, I'm doing good. That's our goal. You who welcome him, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. That's profound doesn't mean nothing bad ever happens when you're a Christian. It means you're now experiencing life on a different plane. You're using this book as the final authority in your life. This is what the truth is to me. How we interpret it, that's going to differ church to church, right? We get, we get that. We should have a short list of things that we argue with people about, right? Jesus is son of God. He was God in the flesh. He died no sin. He resurrected. And because he resurrected with no sin, that's what got us free. There's not a, there's more, but of course, like you get it, right? Like let's not overcomplicate this thing. You don't have to be Einstein to be a Christian. You just have to have faith. And sometimes too much Einstein gets in the way of faith, right? Don't try to figure it all out. Don't believe a lie. Be like the Bereans. Just go figure it out. Get in, into a good Bible study with people that you trust and, and get the truth indoctrinated in your heart. This is where it matters, right here. My mind and my heart. Start with the heart. Where that is, is where your treasure's going to be. Fall in love with Jesus. Amen? You who welcome him, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life now on God's terms. If God raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. All right? So do we want to repent of sin today? Yes. Does that mean you're not a Christian? No. It's just that there's things in my life that are still getting a grip on me. There's nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing. Not only is that not weak, it takes strength to say I haven't fully arrived yet. So can we just lift our hands and say, yes, Lord, I want to be more like you. I haven't fully arrived yet. I'm willing to be pressed so that I can be strengthened in the pressure. I'm willing for you to turn the heat up so the impurities rise up to the surface and that I can be more like you and that I can be used by you on my assignment, why you have me here. If you don't know the Lord, this would be a good time to say yes to him. If you've never invited him into your life, this is the time to do it. You have nothing to lose except depression and pain and a whole bunch of mess that the world's going to offer you. You say yes to Jesus. How many people here, when you said yes, he met you right where you were at? Please make some noise. Okay? He meets you right where you're at. Why? Because he knows you. He knew you when you were conceived in your mother's womb. He's been with you the whole way. You might not have seen him, but he was there. And now he's saying, come on, give me a try. You tried everything else.
give me a try. Did you do that, church? Trisha had all lists of things that, all right, I'll do it, but you got to let me still do this, that, and the other thing. <laughs> and she'll say, he was really threatened by that, I'm sure. Come on your own terms. Say yes to the Lord. You could do it right now. You could do it right here at this altar today. There's no better day than today. If you feel like your feet are nailed to the floor, that's the devil. Step up and step out and come to the altar. Say yes to Jesus. He's calling you. You can feel it. You know there's this prompting on the inside that wants you to come, but there's a resistance that's trying to stop you. Don't let it stop you. Come forward. Come to the altar. Say yes. I'm going to try it. I'm done with that other way of doing things. I'm done. I'm done with the other way of doing it. Ha! Huh. I'm willing to give you a try, Lord. I'm willing to give you a try. Sorry for not starting sooner. But we would all say here, better late than never. Do it today. If you're watching online, don't wait. Do it today. We'll finish with the last verse. When God lives, can you point your hands towards the sister right up here? It's a family now, right? She's part of a family. Oh, beautiful family of God. When God lives and breathes in you, you're delivered from that dead life. That's the message Bible, Romans 8. You are delivered from that dead life, and the Spirit of God comes in. You say yes to Jesus, and the Spirit of God comes in. And now you get direction to move in the right direction. And Lord, we say we will commit to helping people just the way you helped us. We will commit to helping people who are on that journey to find you and not just find you, but to flourish in you. And we speak that over this woman right here, that she will flourish in the things of God. That that seed that got planted today will not go fall on the road, will not fall among weeds, will not get choked off, but the good ground of her heart is going to receive the seed of the word, and she's going to become a weapon in your hand against the works of the enemy. In Jesus' name.